Jeff? All right, folks. Good morning to everybody. Thanks for booking some time off here. I know we have a pretty full office over at the Compass headquarters with folks, and I know we have some people that have dialed in as well. So appreciate everyone taking some time out of their morning to uh, spend some time with us and learn about GDPR and, and what implications that's going to have moving forward as that takes effect in just a couple days now. So Adam Cravati from Compass IT Compliance, he's our Director of Business Operations. He spent quite a bit of time going through and developing uh, this presentation uh, on GDPR and some of the different components and facets of what GDPR is and what it's replacing and what implications that's going to have for uh, organizations around the world really. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Adam. But before I do that, let me just mention this. In the lower left hand corner, there is a chat box. So if you have any questions, please feel free to put those into the chat box. Uh, that way we can answer those questions uh, as time permits later on. Uh, or if there's something that's pertinent throughout the course of the uh, presentation, we can go ahead and answer that at that time. So just remember to put that in the bottom left-hand corner into the chat box. So Adam, I'm going to turn it over to you to go ahead and uh, start the presentation, man. All right. Thank you very much, Jeff. Um, and as Jeff did not know this, but uh, Joel Gawoski is here as well. He represents I'll give Pannon Loves. Pannon Loves, who is Compass's legal, legal team and they also are well versed in GDPR from the legal side, so he is going to be uh, adding some information in uh, to help enhance his presentation uh, from the legal perspective. Yeah, mostly snarky comments. <laughs> yeah, and he's gonna, you know, he's gonna make fun of what I have to say, and he's gonna tell me how wrong I am. No, that's not what's happen. Uh, so Joel is here as well. Uh, so welcome, Joel, and thank you for taking the time out of your day to come help us out. All right, so we're going to keep moving. All right, so as everyone knows, uh, or should know by now, GDPR is imminent um, in terms of it starts on Friday, May 25th. There's no more time left for anybody to get caught up. All right, we are here, it's here, it's now, and there are no more excuses. All right, so there's a lot of people who are sitting out there wondering, what is this all about? If they haven't started looking at it, or if they have, they're still wondering what is this all about because the actual uh, regulation itself is not as crystal clear as we might like it to be. Um, you know, it's been in place uh, from since 2016. That's right? so about 18 months it's been on the books uh, in terms of we knew it was coming. The EU set it up early to get everybody a, lot, a big heads up as, in terms of um, what they were expecting. Um, so that nobody was surprised, but it's still catching a lot of people by surprise. And I would say, from Compass's perspective, uh, probably since about October or November of 2017, it's really become a hot topic button for U.S. companies. And that's when we started hearing a lot more about GDPR and its impact for companies in the United States. Um, so basically, what it what it is is it's a new privacy regulation designed by the EU uh, to replace the 1995 EU um, Data Protection Directive 9095, right? Um, it talks about the safeguarding of the personal <coughs> information of, now this term is very tricky, right? What we're referring to as European data subjects um, and the reason why we say it's tricky is because people say citizens, then you hear people say residents, and there's a, a lot to do about where the person is, when the information is um, provided, and how the information is used, and where that person might move to, and whether they're protected or not. So you, saying resident or saying citizen isn't really um, covering the entire basis of what it can be. Um, but regardless of it doesn't matter who, who collects that information or who processes that information. So it could be a EU company or it could be a company here in the United States. If, we're, if you're collecting this information about EU data subjects, uh, then you're, by all intents and purposes, you're subject to the data, uh, the GDPR regulation. I mean, do you have uh, anything to add on that? Yeah, it's the, you know, that was the thing that people had a hard time getting their mind around. It's persons in the EU. So. 
for example, we work with universities and colleges. They send their students off for summer programs. Uh, RISD has a campus in uh, Italy, I believe, which I volunteered to go to. <laughs> Take me up on that, yeah. But, uh, you know, so they can be American students overseas. It can be American. It can literally be refugees from you know, war torn areas in filling the blank, because God knows there's enough of them, who are in Europe at any given the given time that the data is collected, they're covered. So anyone who has a background in HIPAA, which I've spent the last 20 years doing, I am still to this day kind of working out what in the law we call matters of first impression as to this 20-year-old statute. And that statute is, like if you print it, it's smaller than this. These are just the resolutions to GDPR. This is the actual regulation. And it covers not just health data, but anything, anything about any type of person in any capacity. So people who are involved in HIPAA, look at this, and we just, pulse goes off. And it's, yeah, it's pretty broad reaching. Yeah. Jerry, questions and answer now or later? Um, we'll take questions during. So I have a question with respect to your thought on enforcement of this. How is your union going to enforce the United States? Yeah. Because there's a, there's a group to do it. It has a logistics that's going to happen. Yeah, you see, so there's uh, a couple of tiers to the why should you pay attention to this thing. And one of them is reputational. Because as a business partner, if you pronounce, you know, if you say, say it GDRP, <laughs> like, you know, if you're a possible vendor, you're not getting that job. You know, it's like people that spell HIPAA with two P's. Like, you're just not getting that job. And so that's the first and foremost reason why you should be on it, the illusion of a halo. And hopefully it's not an illusion. Right? An illusion's better than none at all. Then the second reason is that governmental enforcement thing. The supervisory agencies, SAs over there, can fine you, and the fines can be up to 20 million euro or 4% of your annual net revenue. So it's not like HIPAA where that's a million five. They figured out how to layer on things in HIPAA now so that the fines get bigger. It's really egregious. But it's not a death to the company type of fine unless you're some small like, nursing home or something like that. 20 million euro or 4% of your revenue, that can deal with what? Is you know, who in the US or, or how are they going to target? Well, first off, they're going to target their own people because it's easier. Then they're going to target larger entities in some ways because they're over there more often. But the thing is, if they're bumping up against Oracle, GE, IBM, those people, they've got their own in house and external law firms in Europe. So they're more likely to come after mid sized, small sized entities, pose a fine, get it enforced by a US federal court, and go off to the races. Take a breath, and now we're going to talk about the highest point of, uh, of risk on that enforcement chain. Unlike HIPAA, GDPR has a private right of action. <clears throat> So people can sue you, and okay, they can do the class action thing. Your best class action we do, but they also it bakes in a right for nonprofit agencies to stand in the shoes of individuals. And it doesn't even have to say they have their consent, which is so odd because this whole thing is based upon consent of use. <laughs> like you can have. These nonprofits like that thing that Schrems has, or, uh, you know, he's an Austrian lawyer who took on Facebook. Uh, what we see is the real potential for these sort of predatory relationships of law firms over there and over here, where they maybe send you a request to be for guidance, <clears throat> or you know, they notice that you are opt in, that you don't have that right here. 
Then they trot into court in Moldova or Serbia or someplace you know, that we couldn't even get to in three days by air. And they get a judgment against you because you're not there to defend yourself. And then they have a US business partner law firm that trots in the federal court and enforces the judgment. It's a quick way to make $30,000. That's an awesome business model. And so <laughs> we are convinced, but for the reputational harm, you know, we would, well, we were, no, uh, yeah, it, that is a really good business model. And people are going to do that. And so that's where, unlike HIPAA, we're just going to have people come out of the woodwork. Thank you. Yeah, I didn't know Latvia had a court. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thanks. Sir. Sure. No problem. Thanks. Um, so you mentioned American students going to EU. What about EU students coming to America? What yeah. Can they do when they're physically here? So the vice versa works the same, right? It's the same catch. Which data are we protecting? We're going to have to inform on this as we go through this here, but it, it's the same conundrum as the. Are, when they're here, are they protected or are they not protected? Which information, what information is protected, what information is not protected? It's, you know, what do you do with that? And universities are, are going to struggle with that question in colleges and universities because of the, the transient nature of their, um, their constituents. But it's not just universities, uh, as we'll see in a minute. Um, so it doesn't matter um, what you do with the information. Or how you use it, it's, if you're collecting it, you're subject to it, um, and, it and it doesn't matter that you're whether you charge a fee for that service or not. And so it doesn't matter whether you're paying for the service or you're just collecting it. And then this is where we start talking about, um, you know, what is is tracking down all this information that you're being collected. Right? Just uh, simple forms like web forms, like a blog site. Right, where you sign up and register to receive notice about new blogs, for example. Um, if that a EU citizen is entering their personal information there, you have now have to make that site um, compliant with GDPR. Right? And that's not something that's necessarily contained within an application or a database or anything that you might formally know of as your processing process. Right? It's just not there. Uh, so you have to, when you start, when we start talking about what are the steps that we're supposed to be taking in terms of how do we prepare for GDPR, then we need to, you know, we need to look at all that data that we're collecting. Um, and it doesn't matter if the data comes directly from the data subject, or the information comes directly from the data subject, or if it's provided by a third party. Right, so any information that you share or is shared with you, it also needs to be protected. Okay. What industries are covered? Well, it's all industries. Right? But these are some of the ones that have um, a big concern um, <coughs> in regards to the data. Because we're talking about colleges, but not only colleges, hotels, airlines, casinos, large retailers, hospitals, um, U.S. companies with European employers or employees. Right? If, you're, if you're working for a U.S. company and you're in Europe, your data is still going to be protected. It's still expected to be protected. But I mean, hotels, if you're coming from, uh, let's stick with Moldova, right, to visit New York City, right, and you're going to you're gonna book that hotel online, either you're going to book it directly with the hotel website, or you're going to book it through Expedia, or Travelocity, or Travago, or you name it, right, all those, all the information <coughs> collected by those organizations, uh, that's now EU data about an EU citizen, and that information needs to be protected under GDPR. Now, hospitals, the same thing. If you're here on vacation or you know, traveling to the U.S. and you're from uh, you know, Yugoslavia, right, um, and you get hurt, injured, and you have to go to the hospital. Well, now you're entering what's referred to as not only as personal information, but protected personal information, right? uh, information about your health. Right? Um, so all of that and all these industries, but it's not just these industries. These industries are definitely going to be obvious choices, but like I said, it could be any information you're collecting um, on the web anywhere. As Joel talked about um, in answer to one of the questions up here, the fines are not small. 
Okay. It's up to 20 million euros, or 4% of your annual revenue. The term in the economy is annual turnover, but generally um, just another way to say annual revenue. Um, and it's whichever is greater. Okay. So if your annual revenue is 4 million US, right, they can still find you up to 20 million euros because that's greater than 4 million US, obviously. Um, and as Joel also pointed out, uh, right through this slide already, it's uh, the ability for individuals to sue all, all holders of their data. And that, so that means not just the data collector, we haven't really talked about these terms yet, but the data collector is the person that collects the data, obviously, right? Makes sense. Or data processors, which could be this collector as well, or it could be third party um, providers that you're sharing, the collector is sharing the information with to do the processing. And they can sue everybody in that chain for one failure of GDPR. Um, and so, of course, we have not only financial risk, but we also have reputational risk as soon as these lawsuits start hitting the papers and the news, um, or you're going to be sitting out there subject to um, negative press. We know George and then Jerry. George? Our responsibility is on the user to not lie about where it lives. That's a good question. <laughs> Um, you know, I think that there's going to be, we, we can't answer all the questions. Right? There's lots of questions about GDPR today, and, but it still isn't actually active on, you know, in the wild yet. And you know what? Even after May 25th, we're probably going to wait six months, 24 months, you know, it could be five years before we get all the answers, all the questions answered. You know, but that's a good question. It is. Um, and the companies in the U.S. who have information about U.S. and European uh, data subjects might face that question and want to know what to do about it or how to identify it. Um, but most applications aren't designed to make that separation. Right? If you're collecting data, if you're just collecting data, you're storing it in your database, and you're going to process the information in your database. You haven't built in this. You haven't thought about this before, so you haven't built in a process to treat data about EU data subjects differently than you have your normal uh, other data subjects, right? So you don't even have that process. So you can't really tell, but you're going to have to base it on something. Uh, it could be uh, IP address, which, by the way, is also per considered protected private information by the EU data standard. IP address, you're collecting that. Uh, email address, um, physical address, or company address, right? Um, you can't tell them necessarily just by the name, but you could maybe make some determinations by the name. Uh, but you will have to have some way of separating this data so that you can process it now if you want to treat it separately. My recommendation today is uh, that you would want to treat all the data that you have the same. You may not have the same responsibilities for data that isn't about EU citizens and that EU citizens, non-EU citizens aren't going to have the rights to request the information that they have on a GDPR. Uh, but you are going to want to, you may have to find a way to augment your application or the data collection process to determine that. And again, that would be what, is, what, what incentive do they have to not lie about it? You know, hopefully most people are honest. Is yeah. there something to add to that? Yeah, a couple of thoughts. We will see that because what uh, a lot of websites. Say you're an international law firm and you have 100% of your web traffic is foreign. Like, those firms will have an opt-in because now under GDPR you have to. They have to actively opt-in to allow you to use the data. Now, if you are, say, you're a website and you offer deals to some American tourist resort, well, they're going to opt in because they can't get to what they want to look at. Okay, you know, if, if your client is a bank, they're going to opt in. They can do this. Where we may run into that problem, well, I'll come up with two scenarios. One is I'm being sneaky, you know, which is one way of saying that with the rest of really don't. The other is a lot of those opt-in things, and I think this is a very prudent way of doing it, is you have, if you are in the EU, 
it here, okay? And then you go to the opt-in. If you're not, then you just have, down below that, you have the, your privacy policy and all that sort of stuff. Okay? So if somebody doesn't click there, unless your click answer is like way down here where a person would, you know, a reasonable jury would find out that yeah. it's deceptive, then that's their own fault. I, I would enjoy being the litigator who gets to argue why, <laughs> why my client shouldn't be getting a fine for that. That would be a lot of fun. And uh, the, one of the things that, uh, that you mentioned, Adam, that will be really interesting down the road is the question of starting to treat all that this way. Okay. One of the biggest difficulties, and we'll get to it, so I'm not going to blow slide apart, but is the tracking. Like here, it's sort of black box. It's a sort of black box. As long as you've got, it's like the CIA. They don't monitor you when you're inside the building. You just go in. Yeah, once you're there, you belong there, and you, know, you do whatever. Here, you have to track. They can't be used. It gets brutal. And so then, you know, what level of tracking? And there'll be a number of these questions that will come up with. Consent to use, consent to individual use. Can I write this as broadly as possible? And that's kind of where the lawyers come in. Okay, tell me what you want to do. Tell me what you might want to do with this data in the future. This data is the new oil. Okay, what might you want to do? Well, okay, this no, we need a separate authorization. But this, we might be able to word it so that you can do A, B, and C with it, and that kind of thing. So you know, you'll see more and more of that. And you'll see more of those questions of. Do we treat this this way? And just to wrap this part up, we in the US would already have this. There was a very similar, very comprehensive all data kind of privacy law floating around right before 9-11. When 9-11 hit, the security establishment went to Congress and said, we really need to be able to track this data. And so that thing died on the vine. Well, we're far enough in now, 17 years in, soon enough, and without a major incident. So following this, I would not be surprised at all if you see this kind of broad region thing imposed in the US. So yesterday I was uh, at a Boston Bar Association conference on this subject, and we had uh, GEC, the ones I just mentioned, GE, Citrix, uh, IBM, a lot of really, really top companies. And the woman who's in charge of privacy and security for Alibaba in Europe and the US. And they were all talking about that. That you know, we think eventually this is the way the world is going to go. At least this part of the world, the non authoritarian part of the world. And uh, so if if you're on top of that, you're ahead of the game when it comes to Jerry, yeah, so, you, so obviously, much more to talk about is data at rest, that is specific data, store data, whatever. In emotion, so if I'm a gateway or I'm a processor that passes through data for a transaction, uh, are they bound by the European data flowing across their systems, right? I would expect the answer is yes. Yes. Okay. Um, the, other, the other facet of the question uh, I had was relative to data retention. And I've attended several of these. I don't recall anything. Are there any imposed GDPR rules governing data uh, retention? So we're going to talk about that. Oh, it's full slide, sorry. That's okay. It's a good question. Yes, sir. Good. But it's not a specifically imposed retention period. It's that you declare a retention period as a requirement. Like for business purposes. But you must declare a, yeah. you must declare and state a, a retention period, and you must <laughs> adhere to it. But it's your retention period. There's no self, uh, no GDPR yeah, exactly. retention period. Yeah, that's what she knows. Yes. Yep. Okay. Great. Um, hey, look, retention period right there. Um, so detailed disclosures. We were, we're kind of ending on that and talking about that. You must disclose several things, or actually quite a bit, actually, about the data that you're collecting. Um, one of them is you must have a legal and business reason to um, collect this data, right? And you must collect only the data that you need for the purposes that you're using it for, right? So you declare why you're using it, and then you declare what you're going to use it for, right? and then you're going to declare um, who you share that data with, right? And you're going to declare uh, 
how long you're going to store it. So you're going to declare your retention period. Uh, this has to be in these disclosures. It must be in clear and understandable language. Okay. So no offense to all, but we can't legal legal speak it all the way across you know the board. People have to be able to read it and know exactly what it's saying in terms of what we're doing with this data. And we have a couple. I have a couple of examples of some privacy policies that I've gotten from some organizations that I typically use. They just released new ones that are in line with GDPR. So if I can make this work, I'm going to switch that up there onto the screen. Um, just for an idea, uh, if I can find it, look at that. All right. So this um, this came from a, a, actually a UK-based company that is uh, information uh, that I use when I'm for a soccer coach. Right. Basically, they publish lots of drills and ideas and things like that. So they released a new privacy policy, and as I as I read through it. Um, normally, I would just say, fine, whatever, but since I knew it was out because of GDPR, and I knew I was giving this talk, and I said, well, when, when, maybe I should read this. So it says, what kinds of personal information about you do we process? So what data are we collecting? Right? And as we scroll through this, I'm not going to read everything that's on that screen. Um, what is the source of your personal information? So that is something we talked about. It doesn't matter where that information comes from. But you must declare where you're collecting that information from. If it's not directly from the data subject, I have to clearly declare that I'm collecting that from a third party and how I'm getting this data. I must put that in my policy. Okay. Um, <coughs> what do we use your personal data for? Right. So this is exactly right. This is step for step right out of GDPR's requirements. Right? They just pretty much said, okay, this is the questions we need to ask or answer, and this is how we're going to answer it. And then they go through and describe what they're using the data for. Um, most of it's marketing and other things. Um, what are the legal grounds for processing your personal information? Like we said that this is one of the things that you have, must have a legal reason for collecting this data. Okay, and then they, you know, do a little explanation or a long explanation of, of that. Um, when do we share your personal information with other organizations? Okay, so if we're you're going to share it, we're going to say that. We, we share it, right? Uh, is your personal information transferred outside the UK or the e, EEA? Um, that's not necessarily a requirement in GDPR, but it's probably something that they are sharing anyway. So EU citizens, they don't like their data being stored somewhere else. So they're very sensitive about that, especially in the US where we have the US Patriot Act and other things that allow the NSA and remember else to read your data, right? So that's um, not necessarily a GDPR issue, but it is an issue that they have. Um, what should you do if your personal information changes? So we're going to talk about some of this. This is kind of one of the pieces of, that you can do when you talk uh, one of your individual's data subject individual rights to request um, that your data be uh, corrected if it's in here. So if your information changes, uh, you have steps that you can do. Uh, do you have to provide your personal information to us? Well, of course not, but then you can't use our services, right? And for how long? So here's a retention period section. How long is your personal information retained by us? And what are your rights under the data protection laws? And they talk about your right to object to processing, your right to restrict processing, have your personal information released, erased, the right to be forgotten. Uh, all of these are specific requirements that are built into GDPR today. And we're going to talk about some of these um, shortly. Uh, your right to object. Um, what are your marketing purposes? You, this is more of an um, opt-in sort of you know, consent form. Okay. So this is an example. This is one example of, um, of what a privacy policy might look like, uh, or a disclosure in this case, uh, what might look like in regards to GDPR. Okay. And this is one that I got personally. Um, I do have another one up here. We're not going to spend as much time on this because this one's super long. This is a U.S.-based company, um, and then I, it's not quite as clear um, in terms of it's not laid out directly like GDPR, like the last one was. But it talks about the same things. You know, what information do we collect? Um, you know, information we automatically collect, so on and so forth. Websites that are used. Um, yes, it is GoPro, by the way. Um, Mobile software, everything. This one is super long. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. It's not quite as clear. 
Uh, but we were talking about the opt-in option here, and uh, this is an example of a website. Uh, also has a, a location in the EU. In, um, is it UK? I forget. Yeah, in the UK, but which is not part of the EU. Officially, the English they don't like be part of things. Right. They, they, they state at this point that that England, England, Wales, you know, that Great Britain, I should say, is going to stay in GDPR. Yep. That's their latest position. We have no reason to think they won't. So this is basically when you go to their website, you have this that says we want to stay in touch, so please opt in today, and you have an opt-in here. Uh, this opt-in option, right, we didn't really talk specifically about that, but it is, um, it must be an, an actual physical, I have to say physical, we're putting out a, a link here, but it has to, it can't be automatically opted in, right? It has to be you choose. So if you're going to put an opt-in radio button or a check mark, or in this case it's a link, right, which you actually physically have to click on, which it, which complies, but you can't have a pre-filled in box on your site for opt-in, right? So the, the person, the data subject, has to actually select that as their choice. Right? So it has to be clear consent lock, uh, lock um, opt-in option. In this case, it's a, you would click on this link, which is actually on the real website. It's a button. In PDF, the button didn't come over, but it still said opt-in. And then you would be directed over here to their data policy, their privacy policy or disclosure. Okay. And again, we're not going to go through that, but it's definitely related to GDPR. And I hear my Skype beeping, so that might mean there's a question online. While you're reading that, I'll just throw in. You can see from the last ones that were uh, the one that was EU based, and you can see why, if you're dealing with an American client, why you would want to have that. Hey, are you from the EU? Are you there right now? If so, click here, because you probably don't want to have that phone book on your web, you know, on one of the primary customer facing pages of your website. It's just a lot of verbiage. The click here thing gives you that nice option, and then the opt in. Okay, so there's not a question. Somebody is having Skype issues. So um, we're going to continue on. Uh, any questions about that, uh, George? The data retention period, does it reset? So if I collect, if I have a three year data retention period and I hand the data to Todd, is Todd forming my data retention period, or does he follow it up? It's, it, he might have his own, which he's declared to you. As, if he's a third party, he's a third party processor or whatever that happens to be. But the data subject has a relationship with you. It's your data retention period. So he can reset my data retention period by handing it back? No. No. The, which then gets to uh, avoiding a physical number. Number, but we get the point. Like words <laughs> rather than numbers are often better there. Because what you're saying is, you keep your data for as long as we need, need to do, uh, need to have it to do what we've said we're going to do. <laughs> when we no longer need that, then we'll destroy it. And then, uh, this is probably for a future uh, discussion, but then you get to the whole thing of, well, we've pseudonymized the data. Versus anonymous. So if you want to be cool, like not just that it's PR, it's pseudonymization. If you can say that in a conversation, you sound like you might be talking about it. You're a step ahead of most people in that again, no segregation for anyone. And so uh, pseudonymized data where you've got say you've got a de-identified registry. I have a client that has this, they have uh, they're the largest health data uh, entity in America. They have the claims down on 220 million Americans, effectively National Security Agency of Healthcare. And they have a, a registry that is de-identified. So if their health plan partners need them to run some numbers on that, they match it up for that. And then they can 
they can delete the re-identification key any time a client leaves, but they've got this wonderful pool of de-identified data that they can draw just incredible insights that you know, people are born on Tuesday in Baltimore, with this and the other comorbidity are more likely to have a third readmission for you know, stage two this. It can, you know, the, the interventions that can be drawn from these enormous de-identified databases are really, really valuable. And so this thing, if, if you do it right, it allows you to do that. It allows you to keep this de-identified data so that you're, you're eliminating, you know, your, well, we need to do, we needed to have your data be able to identify you while we were a business partner of this health plan. But then once our relationship ended, I, then I'll destroy your re-identification key. But I've got this other stuff that is no longer you, but it was drawn from you. And I get to keep that. So it sounds like the data retention period is complete fluff and means nothing. I don't know that I'd go that far because it's so easy to go around it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The uh, it, it's fluff and it means nothing unless you're the person being scrutinized for keeping it too long, and then it will go really badly. You know, so it's it's not like somebody from the EU is going to be helicoptering in to check. It's just like HIPAA. I think most of the, the fraud and abuse laws, healthcare fraud and abuse laws get violated every single day in this country. Where it really matters is that people get scrutinized. Like for them, then it's really, really an issue. Mm -hmm. But for the people who get away with it, it's no big deal. So. Yeah, and we did talk about this uh, customer ability to consent. Uh, one thing to note out that the data controller collector must be able to show that the consent was given. And so you must keep that. You must track that and uh, make sure that you can show that consent was given. Uh, if uh, Another thing is if the purpose that you're collecting the data for changes, or you're going to do something new with that data, you must redisclose and then re-consent, get collect consent again uh, for that. So if you're collecting it for one reason and then all of a sudden you're going to switch it, you're going to use that data for something different, you must disclose that change and then accept the consent again uh, with regards to that. And this is the one piece I'd say, I mean, all of these are supposed to be in place by May 25th. But if you're going to be collecting information about you citizens after May 25th, you, you must have these disclosures and consent forms ready to go. Uh, there will be any, I don't think there will be any um, excuses if you're not. If you've ignored it up to now and you haven't done anything, this would be the thing that I would do tomorrow. I would put these consent forms out and get these disclosures ready, just have them out there so that there's, you know, at least you've done that much and you've shown that you are at least um, aware of and alert to GDPR's requirements. Um, so we talked about this, what as an individual, as a data subject, what rights do I have? I have several. Um, most of them are, and this is something else that you'll have to have ready, is some form or format for a data subject to submit a subject access request form, right, or a SAR. And I have several rights. I will talk about them when we look through the um, privacy policy from the other company that I showed. Um, but I have the right to, uh, it says, have access to all the data collected. Well, that doesn't mean that you have to give them username and login to your database. What it does mean is that upon request, you have to provide them a copy of all the data that you have collected for them so that they can review it. Uh, if they want to take their data and give it to somebody else, you have, you have to provide that data in a format that allows it to be easily transferred to somebody else. It can't be in a proprietary, non-readable format. Right? It must be able to be you know, moved over to another provider or data collector or whoever they want to do. They have the right to request that. Um, they have the right to request that the information be corrected. So if it's incorrect or if something changes on it, um, they have the right to request this. Um, they have, this is the big one that most people fret about because of the data chain, but all this applies to the entire data chain. Right? 
but I have the right to be forgotten or my data to be erased from your system. Uh, I think early on we had a conversation about that um, in, a, in a little meeting that we had about what does that mean? I can ask you for, to forget my data. Does that um, sever my relationship with the organization? Yes, absolutely. That's the end of the relationship. Right? I can't sign up for a service then want me to remove my data and keep the service. Right? So you know, this uh, the challenge here is tracking that information, where it goes, who has it, and you know, throughout the entire process, this is the challenge. Right? And where is all the data that I've collected? Right? Because oh, by the way. There's no ex there's no exceptions to this. It's replacing an old directive, but all the data you've correct collected historically is subject to GDPR. So you must know all the data you already have and where all that data is. It's not starting over May 25th. It's historic. All the data you've collected so far up to date is still going to be covered by GDPR. Jerry. Except in BIP format, right? BIP format was the exception. Yes. Any um, data retained at any point in time in paper format. Is out of scope. Correct. It's not paper is not covered by GDPR at least today. Right? That's different than from PCI right? and HIPAA, um, where you're protecting that, that hard copy information as well. Here it's only electronically stored data. Okay, so yes, good point, Jerry. Thank you. Um, they can also object. We saw that as well. I can object to what you what you're using my data for if that changes, or if you're selling it outside, I can say I don't want you to do that part of this. Um, but I don't want you to forget me, I just don't want you to do that. I don't want you to sell that to that marketing firm or whatever it happens to be. Those last couple are going to be areas that uh, there'll be lots of lawyers' kids being put through college on those. You know, the right to be forgotten. Well, not so much. Like if I get to use it in college, you know, may want to be forgotten on that particular class. No, no, you don't get to do that. You know, bio, I own my bank. Like I really like my mortgage to be forgotten. Which <laughs> 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 yeah. The answer to that is uh, no. And so they'll be, you know, those are comical extremes, but you can see lots of places where no, we can't take you out of the system for a whole variety of reasons. And then the last one though, the the Use beyond that which I envisioned then is easy to editorialize on. <laughs> we, we live in a world now where people hold these sort of dichotomous views of, I want to be on Facebook and I want to be private. Well, uh, that's really <laughs> not how it works. <laughs> yeah. And, like I know, you know, data is I said this morning, but data is the new world. And the collectors of data are they have this tentpole asset that has unbelievable applications across imaginable spectrums of monetization. I just say that they don't want to forfeit that right, and they're not gonna go quietly into that. So there's going to be a lot of litigation around, you know, just even, did you word that? Yeah, you put it in plain language, but I can put things in non-lawyer language that are still like, oh, we meant that. Yeah, and that'll be a big area, I think, you know, I can envision uh, that coming up where you have a client and they they look at some different potential uses of the data that they're collecting, and they ask, okay, how can we write this? And help you with that is trying to get where, well, that's a reasonable reading. Might not have been the way you read it, but a reasonable person would include that. Yeah. Has the EU provided any kind of like safe harbor language in that regard to some of these Structures and things at all? No. No. They, they, they're still, they're kind of like college students waking up with a tattoo. <laughs> we, we did what? <laughs> we, we, we passed this, this law, really? Oh, we've got to enforce this? We've got to determine what this means? Oh, well, it seemed like a good idea at the time. Yeah, and that's sort of where they are. That's why you know, your first comment about 
on May 28th that are they going to do the end of month? Are they going to be showing up, you know, at the front doorstep of American companies? Uh, probably not so much. What is going to happen, though, it, it's just something that uh, a lot of big people talked about yesterday, they're going to get bombarded with a flurry of notifications from do-gooders saying, we don't comply with Article 28, subsection C, 3, 4. We, oh my God, the world's going to end. You know, like they're going to get bombarded because this is a subset of compliance, which is sort of a subset of the law. These are real right-handed people. This appeals to right-handed people with a very high sense of conscientiousness. And so the people who are involved in this for a living are prone towards, and you can tell you from 20 years of compliance and privacy and healthcare, are, are disposed towards over-reporting. And they're going to be so inundated with that that the fact that your clients are just now spinning this stuff up, nothing to lose any sleep for. By the time, by the time it comes to us, we'll be in good shape. And one thing to add on the right to be forgotten is that it does not supersede any existing state or federal laws that require you to retain data for another reason. Right? So you can't. So forget about the idea of getting out of those D's and F's on your college transcript, because those are required to be maintained by the universities for at least seven years by the FERPA. So, yes, I'm sorry, Serena, you're, you're stuck with all your ages. <laughs> um, so, yeah, so that's good points. Okay. Um, so, GDPR security concerns. This, uh, there's. Uh, one article in the that talks about security privacy of data, but it is very vague. Um, these are uh, direct quotes from that article. Okay, I'm going to read them. I don't know. I'm going to read off my slides, but I'm going to read them. Data controller and processor shall implement appropriate technical and organizational measures to ensure a level of security appropriate to the risk. What the hell does that mean? Right? It means do the best you can, right? I guess. I mean, there's no real. It doesn't say you must protect this data. You must encrypt it. You must anonymize it. You must, you know, deduplicate it. It doesn't say that. It just says appropriate measures, technical and organizational measures. What does that mean? Right? And then a risk assessment should be conducted on all GDPR data, and controls should be assessed to ensure they are appropriate to the risk. Again. Exactly what does that mean? There is no real clarification here at all, and I don't anticipate one coming anytime soon. Um, what we've seen in, in, you know, or heard or read, I mean, you may have read everything. Today, if you're on the web, there's three days ago to GDPR, what are the three things you need to do today? Five things, five days ago is what are the five things you need to do? You know, you're looking at GDPR and following it, you're seeing everybody is writing stuff and putting stuff out there, and it's we, you know, what we've done in this research is trying to get the things that most people are saying that we believe are, are true. In terms of um, in terms of what do I do? How do I protect this? It's built upon what you already have in place. Right? So if you've gone through a HIPAA assessment, for example, or high trust, you know, build upon that. Extend that out to include EU um, data subject information. Right? If you've done PCI. Right? PCI is only looking at one type of data, which is, by the way, covered by GDPR, but not that's not the only data that's covered by GDPR. So build upon that risk assessment. Or if you've done something that's more um, you know, overarching for IT, like ISO. ISO 27005 was the one that we had heard that was recommended. We here at Compass do a lot of ISO 27001-2 audits, which I think would give you a good foundation for protecting this information. But build if you haven't had if you haven't done any of that, then start. Right? Start now this cybersecurity, ISO, COVID, you name it, start with something. But um, you know, you have to do something. They're not telling you what that is, they're not really being very specific about what that is, but they want you to do something appropriate 
technical and operational measures. Jerry, you had a question. For, for our IT auditors, I mean, this is no different than what we do, right? We assess risk-based assessments. So based on the higher risk areas, we're identifying control weaknesses, we're putting in appropriate controls to mitigate those risks to reasonable levels. You don't remove risk completely. That's, that's just a fallacy. Uh, so this is perfectly in line with the way our auditors are certified training uh, to address these kind of things. So I think, I mean, to me, that seems crystal clear, but, uh, but that's what we do. Well, people are looking for direction, right? And they're not getting that out of GDPR. Um, it's just, it's just a, you know, based on the, the size of the GDPR you know, articles and everything they've written, they just aren't clear here at all. And the rest of it is, actually a lot of it's not where it's clear, it's clear as mud. Yes, I'm going to add an angle. Or... Yeah, before we get to, because you assume you'll be at the steps to take now stage. I, I would put that, I think that was uh, an excellent kind of framework to put these next few slides into the risk based assessment concept. That's really what you're doing with your clients is kind of walking through saying, hey, where are my kind of level one, two, three is a frequent way that you see it done. We need to have this, the real exposure areas buttoned up. These other areas, yeah, we need to open those eventually. And then the same thing where people frequently going to find themselves in a position where they say, wish we had done that, it is coming up with an incident response plan. Oh, and that, that's something I know there are some clients on the, uh, on the Skype right now, I think. Uh, this is something that I think this firm can really help you with, is developing that incident response plan now, because uh, like yesterday the Mass Assistant Attorney General was in charge of all of this. Uh, I know her from a couple other presentations she's given, and her thing was they can tell right away who's making it up on the fly and who's got an incident response plan that they're following. And following, you know, you always sort of, there's always room for, huh, we didn't quite see this coming. So you've got a plan, but you're not going to limit yourself by that. But you say, that we can tell right away. They don't have a plan. They're the ones that it goes back to work. And the people would sort of have a plan. Yeah, you had some problems there. You've already identified corrective actions. The AG doesn't have to come back to you and tell you these things, etc. You're walking your clients through that. So those are the two big frameworks that you can really add value is helping them understand the risk assessment as they go through the identify where your data is, all the steps, and then really develop an incident response plan now. We can have a whole session on that later on. Uh, is it a response plan? Right. A couple pieces that you need to add that aren't meant, might not necessarily be in your existing incident response plan. Uh, there's this breach notification section. Now there's lots of breach notification regulations out there today. Uh, Massachusetts has their own, um, CMR, 201 CMR 17. Uh, and so on and so forth. HIPAA has their breach notifications, right? Uh, PCI has their own. But in this case, GDPR has said, okay, you must notify uh, affected individuals and the other uh, responsible parties, the supervisory board, and all that, within 72 hours of a breach being detected. If I could just stop you there. Okay. Anyone who's done HIPAA for 20 years, like when that number 72, First came out. I, I was like, that, that, that can't be right. So it must be 72 from when you finally concluded. No, no it's 72 from when you knew or should have known. Yeah. You know that. So that's three, basically three days. And this applies, again, to your entire data chain. Right? So if you've shared this data down the chain, fifth, you know, fifth party vendor, whatever happens to be, and they get breached, it's 72 hours for you to notify once they detected the breach. So that means that you have to write in some uh, process or language or something in your agreement that says they must notify you within like 24 hours of that detection so that you have time to turn around and notify the data subjects and the other parties. So this is really something that uh, speeds up the clock. 
basically get, get. It makes everything go much faster in terms of reacting to a data breach, and protecting information, and disclosing that breach. Um, and so that, and they specifically say this must be part of your incident response plan. And then you must document uh, a process for tracking all the breaches and then how you handle those breaches. Right? And all that's that's kind of normal incident response. You you know you write down the event and all the things that you do to take care of it. But this notification piece really speeds up that process. Right? I mean, so that that's a, you know something that's really important to add to those incident response plans. Okay, um, as we talked about. As we've been talking about what GDPR is, so here's kind of Compass's ideas and what we put together in terms of you know, what should you be doing or what should you have been doing for the last 12 months or 18 months. Right? This is not a small, short, easy process. We've talked to we've talked to a number of clients um, over the past month or so with the same questions. Right? And they've asked, you know, okay, we're looking at GDPR, we have some some part of our business or a lot of our business is done in the EU, you know, we have this information, we've identified, you know, the applications that are, are collecting this information, but um, and that's the first step, is identifying how, what sources, where that information comes from, how we collect it, and everything that's collected. Um, it's pretty, in most cases, pretty easy to do that for your applications. The application that you have, that's kind of your, your bread and butter of your business, the services you offer, wherever it happens to be. Um, and where's that data stored? You know, you know where that data is stored, who the data is shared with. If you're sharing it, you know you're sharing it. Although I would be honest with you, some of the people I've talked to don't really know if they're sharing data or not. There's someone that happens outside of um, a different part of the organization, um, or that happens in a different part of the organization than the IT, which is you know, generally we speak to a lot of IT people. But this GDPR goes beyond IT. Right? We need to include all facets of the organization in this process. Because as an IT manager or a CIO or someone, I may not know what all these applications are doing and how we're collecting all that data, and not to mention what the marketing pools, I mean, sorry, Jeff, what the marketing people do. Um, so you need to include all the all different parts of the organization, and including your own legal counsel, because um, of all all the things that you have to make sure that you're disclosing it properly, they should be involved as well. Um, and then once you've collected all this information about the data that you have, that you've stored, that you're collecting, um, you need to know: is this truly the data that we need? Right? Do we really need all of this information to do what we need to do? With it? With it because as you recall, we have to have a legal and business case for collecting the information and we are only allowed to collect the information that we need to perform these functions. Right? So we want to make sure that we're not collecting extraneous information that we don't really need. But nice to have information, yes, maybe, but we don't really need it. Right? Um, and then, so that, that covers the applications and the services, but then we get to this, this bolded, underlying, really big issue of unstructured data. What does that mean? Well, it's data that you may or may not be collecting in a formal manner that's just provided. It could be uh, contact information. It could be sitting in an email that uh, was shared. Somebody sent the information through email or you sent the information via email. And as we should all know, email is a store and forward system. So that's, that information is sitting in your mail server, even if it's been deleted from some of the user's inbox, it's still sitting on your mail server. How do we deal with that? It could be sitting on other mail servers which are out of your purview, which necessarily may not be your responsibility, but we don't know the answer to that question yet from GDPR as to how, you know, how much of that is my responsibility, right? And what are we going to do with this unstructured data in, in chat or email or other forms like web forms or things like that that are not necessarily sitting in an application that we've designed or that we've purchased that we're using. Right? So we have to answer that question, uh, or at least we have to be asking that question to say, is there any place else that we didn't think about? And this is what happens when we talk to clients, is that they didn't think about it. And they go like, oh my god, I thought it was 1% of my business. Well, maybe it's not. Maybe we have to talk about it. You know, is that an email? Because we send emails back and forth all the time. And if they have a signature, well, guess what? Now you have a name. Right? And that's as simple as that's all it takes is that name to say, now we have to do something with that. And what is it that we do? And again, 
we don't really know the answer to that question, especially when it comes to email, because I don't really think, I think the tattoo was, uh, was not spelled correctly. Right? <laughs> right? They woke up and they said, holy crap, what the hell is that? What did I do? No and, regrets. And, you know, regrets? <laughs> no regrets. No regrets. Right? <laughs> so we don't really know. And, you know, that question comes up and we, you know, we have to say, you know, be prepared. Document it. Right? Write it down. Say, we, we know that we might have information in our email system. We're going to maintain our server. We're going to know what we're going to do with that. But you know, be prepared for that. Well, what's the next step? What's the next hop? You're sending someone else. Who's responsible for that? Right? Because that's not really normal. That's unstructured, right, in the terms of, of a business process. Um, so that's, you know, this is the biggest piece, right? This you should have been doing, like, a year ago. We're preparing now, today. It's way too late, but now... It's better to start now than it is to just ignore it. Right? Because what you're going to see is that people who are preparing, have a plan, are addressing it, are aware of it, they're going to get um, you know, the, OK, you're doing something. Right? The people who are ignoring it, saying this is going to bother us, we don't care, those are the people who are, are going to have much more scrutiny put upon us. Yeah, and, uh, this, is a, uh, this is a big challenge to this. One of the other things that we want to really add here, too, is you know, we've got to undertake this effort a lot of organizations for data governance, right? So, so not only identifying where it is and controlling it, protecting it at rest and in motion, but putting a, a governance in to control, you know, stop the bleeding from new stuff coming in. So while you're addressing what you've determined through this exercise, you know, as important as that is stopping new, new data from coming uh, into the organization, right? So that, so that putting in controls so that, you know, if, if, an organ, if uh, you know, another silo within your business is, you know, just turning up another Oracle database that you don't know about. And, and that was one of the biggest challenges we've done data covers for a number of different industries. And every time that is one of the real gotchas. So, so I would add that to uh, one of the controls. Well, to, to follow on that, the data governance concept, uh, to go back to my thing about it, this was almost, something similar was almost the law 16 years ago uh, here in the US. We're going there. There are federal courts that have said, that as a matter of law, if you have somebody's personal information, you you have a duty under laws of negligence to protect that. And if you breach that duty, then you are negligent and then subject to all damages. So we're seeing this coming at us from all fronts, that privacy. Here in the online world, privacy is a fundamental human right, which, you know, again, you can have fun editorializing about that tension, but that's the tension that's going to be driving your clients, the, the, the universe your clients work in. And so what this provides, I see, is it, it seems like a lot of work, and, and it, it is, particularly if you're a very large business, it does a lot of work in your but if you only really kind of dabble, but you feel like you need to do it, what this provides is an opportunity to build those frameworks that are coming our way. You know, it just, this is the opportunity. You might as well run with it so that your guys, your clients will never be the ones five, 10 years from now who get flat footed by some, some federal court action. And I'm like, wait a minute, there's no real law here. And it's suddenly, I, you know, I'm, I'm, or the plaintiff is making new law here in the U.S. at my expense. Great. Um, like I said earlier, when we talked about this section, was that you should have these, uh, these disclosures and consents. They should be ready to go on Friday. Right? I mean, if you haven't thought about it. Uh, or if you don't have an idea, you might have a privacy policy already. Uh, it might be time to start adding language in that covers your GDPR, right? especially if you know you're dealing with uh, EU data subjects. Right? So, so we can, uh, Compass here is partnered with um, the Dome Loans, and you know, they certainly are a resource that we can direct you to in terms of how to structure these. I mean, we don't really have templates. The EU doesn't provide any templates or any direction in terms of that goes. So, you know, our advice is start with what you have and then add in the necessary pieces. Right? But these, these must be ready, uh, the opt in as well. So, yeah.
you know, this is this continues on um, more on the lines of data governance, but still, you know, identifying data, classifying data, um, tracking that data through the whole process because you're required to track all those transactions that that happen with that data, all the costs that you do, you have to keep a record of that for GDPR now. Um, and so that definitely is going to increase the overhead that you have and you need to be prepared for that. Um, if you're sharing data with vendors, make sure you maintain a good list of those vendors. You know where that data is going at all times and you know why they're collecting it and you know what they're doing with it. Um, the, the funny thing about it, I don't even know if this is funny, but GDPR says in one of the articles that you must use a GDPR compliant third party vendor. But there is no process for a you know, certifying a vendor as GDPR compliant. We had this I had this question yesterday, as a matter of fact. Somebody was asking, can you, you know, go through a GDPR assessment and then give us some sort of certification? And it's like, uh, no, because there's no mechanism for doing that. There's no, you know, there's no this is what you must be to be GDPR compliant. The best we can do is say we assessed you to the GDPR standard and we found you to be, you know, in line with it or you know complying with all the requirements. But there's no certification. Although GDPR says you must use a certified third party vendor. Okay? So it's like, okay, which is it? Now the expectation here is or the understanding is that we're they kind of give themselves the, the room to say, we're gonna build this eventually, have some certifying body. And have a certification. But it's not there today, it won't be there on May 25th, it might not be there until GDPR 2.0 or 3.0, whatever, whatever happens next. But there's so there is no certification officially. Okay, which which means again that you must be doing, we go back to the data security module that says we must be doing appropriate measures, um, business and technical and operational measures to secure this data, well, we must to be appropriately compliant with GDPR, uh, for whatever that means, for whomever that means it for. Uh, I think it was one of the U.S. attorneys who was speaking yesterday, he said if someone tells you they're GDPR certified or wrong. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, yes, because it, they're not. There's just no way, to, there's no way to prove it, right? Um, we didn't really touch on this, but the uh, requests, right, the SAR, the subject access request forms. Um, it's the turnaround, they use a different term in their EU speak. Um, but basically, you, you have, without undue delay, I believe is what it says. Right? What the hell is that? Right? So we're, for most of us, we're interpreting that to mean within 30 days. So you must answer those SAR requests and the right to be forgotten, to access my data, to um, provide my data if I want to move around or change my data, within 30 days. Without undue delay. I don't know why they write it that way. But anyway, this is the, uh, so any questions on that? This is, you know, these are kind of the things that you need to be prepared for when you start processing data within the GDPR uh, guidelines. Uh, and you know, this talks about can I can I answer those SAR requests without undue delay? And you know, we. Here at Compass, we've done a lot in terms of vendor management, vendor management programs, uh, especially in the banking world where the finance are required to have a vendor management program, vendor due diligence, they call it. Right? So this is just taking that and extending it out to you know all your third parties in any industry and in any organization. You should know, you should have a vendor due diligence program that says, yes, I'm sharing data about my customers with you and you must take the same appropriate, the same safeguards that I take for protecting that data, you must do as well. And so you're going to follow that up with checking their security policies, their program, their backup, their protection, you know, their redundancies, all that kind of stuff. So same steps you, the same or better, right? Yeah. You know, and, and, well, that's just, that's, again, that's a thing that you guys can bring. Because you have experience in finance and some health care, like, like, just enormous chunks of industry that are just waking up to this. And so you can deliver that experience as a firm that when you go into your clients, this is all new to them. And so it's a value add point to one of them. So as this talks about, as you're managing your, managing your third party vendors and maintaining that relationship so that you know 
that you can count on them to report a breach if it happens within a timely manner, that they're protecting that data to the same level or higher that you are. Um, you know, so managing that, putting in a nice third-party vendor management solution will be really, truly helpful. Do you have anything else to add, Joel? Does anyone have any questions? So good. That's what we have. Well, George, have a question? Uh, what's the organization that's actually doing the $20 million fighting? It's the supervisory authority of the weed. It's the weed supervisory authority within uh, the 26 supervisory authorities. So, if, for example, if you had, uh, you have a client and they have a physical location in Ireland, then Ireland is almost certainly going to be their supervisory authority. If you have, what well, frequently you'll have over here is, I send out you know, on pets.com or whatever, and I say, you know, I have, 12 of the European, the 26 European countries buy my stuff. <laughs> then they get to, do, you know, they get to decide amongst themselves who's the lead supervisory authority, and then they how they divvy up any money that they actually get. That's that's where the the, the, the college student tattoo the comes up. Some, they, there's someone that officially can charge you 20 million dollars. Oh yes, yes. So what rights as an individual do you have to sue for money? Yeah, that's a private right of action. It's baked right into the thing. So regardless of whether you've got a supervisory authority in you, it's like HIPAA. What people have figured out is even though HIPAA doesn't give a private right of action, most states in the nation have a common law right to privacy. And the states where it's been tested have concluded that, yeah, if you violated HIPAA, you violated my right to privacy. And therefore, you've got Health and Human Services, uh, Office of Civil Rights, OCR, that is the regulatory agency that can give out fines. So you're dealing with them. Meanwhile, you've got a lawsuit where the affected individuals are also suing you. And that's what you'll see here. But I, our, free, our I really think you're going to see more of the lawsuits, particularly for our kind of clients, more of those lawsuits. So. But I'm, am I suing you for the right to be forgotten, or am I suing you for money? Oh, you do. You do anything. Well, the, by the time you get into suing, there's some money in that. Right? Because some of the not-for-profits that, that can be uh, empowered to enforce this thing on your behalf. Some of them are truly altruistic, like that Matt Schrank guy. I know there are a lot of people that hate him in the data world, but like he's, I don't get any sense that he's profiteering off of this. He's just a young idealistic lawyer who believes in the right to privacy. So as a citizen of the, of, of the West, I kind of think that's pretty cool. But there will be entities out there that are going to be taking a more mm -hmm. uh, more profit-driven approach. Generally, to get a lawyer, to get involved, to do all of that, there has to be somebody paying the bill at the end of the day. That would be your client. So you know, that's you can expect that there'll be money sought. And is there anything in GDPR that provi uh, prevents private citizens from maliciously attacking companies with their private data? What do you mean maliciously like, attacking I can easily write a program that just crawls across the internet looking for things that ask me for personal data yeah. minus the opt-in. Yeah. Now I just sue the shit out of everybody. Yeah, exactly. That's what I'm saying. That's what I'm saying. Isn't this a great business model? Like anyone who thinks, you know, it's funny, you hear this, like, is GDPR a good thing or a bad thing? And people go, well, it's a good thing. And what, what I think, look, I, every once in a while I get themes that kind of go through my head for an extended period of time. But right now, the thing, unintended consequences, <laughs> is on my, on my mind. And the unintended consequences of this are enormous. Yeah, and that's just one of them. And engineers will tell you that if you make a change to a system 
and the system is large enough, it will have an unintended consequence. And if you make a large change to a large system, <laughs> you'll have multiple unintended consequences that often result in failure points, unforeseen failure points. Right? Why do they think that this, why do they think this is just going to go over like, you know, like no problem? Is it is unbridled optimism in my my assessment. But we live in a world where increasingly there are a very small number of ten pole entities that know everything about us and use that uh, you know, in ways that we did not imagine. So we'll uh, like that attention. Okay. Any other questions in the room? Jeff, any questions online? Nope, does not look like there's any questions online. Okay, well, if there aren't any other questions, Joel, thank you very much for taking the time. Everybody here, thank you very much for uh, joining and spending your morning with us. Um, if you have any questions that come up from GDPR, or this is for the Compass people in the room or online, if any of your clients are asking questions about GDPR and don't know where to go, what to do, how to start, Get them, get them connected up. You know, I'll be happy to sit on the call, talk to, talk to them, answer any questions they might have, and get them started. Okay. So otherwise, enjoy the rest of your day, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.